Hello, everybody. And my name is uh, Jan Piasecki, and I would like to officially commence the Twitter Research uh, Ethics Online uh, Seminar of the Web Immunization uh, Project. Uh, I can see that we have uh, participants from all around the world. That's really great. Thank you for joining us. And before, before I introduce our guests and our speakers, I would like to remind you about uh, two things. So the, f f the first thing is that uh, our research project is uh, funded by the EEA grants and operated by the National Science Center in Poland. And moreover, our session is being recorded and the video will be later on available on our website and on our YouTube channel. And right now it is my supreme ple ple pleasure to introduce to you our guest and moderator of the seminar, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Buchanan, and she's a director of the Office of Research Support Services and Senior Research Scientist at the uh, Marshfield Clinic Research Institute. For over 20 years, Elizabeth's scholarship has focused on research ethics, compliance and regulations, specifically about internet, social media, and big data research. Our second guest is Dr. Nicholas Proferes, who is an assistant professor at Arizona State University School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. His research interests include users' understanding of social uh, technical systems such as social media, societal discourse about technology, and issues of power and ethics in the digital landscape. And finally, I would like to welcome another guest, but a speaker, the member of our uh, web immunization research team, Professor Mikołaj Morzy, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Computing at Poznan University of Technology. His research interests focus on machine learning and its application in natural language processing, complex network system and social networks. You can find more about our speakers at by visiting our website. Also, you, you, you can learn a little bit more about our research projects. Uh, project and now I'm disappearing and I'm passing the microphone to Elizabeth Buchanan. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, can you see my slides? Okay. Yes. Okay. No, um, we, we, we can see you in the um, uh, presenter view. So uh, uh, we, we can see al also the next slide and. Yeah. Um, is it this one? Okay. Yeah, it works. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Perfect. very good. Okay. Um, well, hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, many thanks to uh, Dr. Piasecki uh, and his team. Uh, many thanks to Agnieszka for her organizing um, this session. And uh, a big congratulations to, to the team on your uh, successfully funded project. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here, too, with uh, Drs. Morsi and Proferas. Um, I will be uh, providing some brief uh, remarks and then uh, moderating the session. Um, I'm going to ask that you hold your questions. Um, we, you can send them in throughout uh, the session uh, and then we'll address questions at, at the end. Um, I just wanted to just uh, say that I have no uh, conflicts of interest related to this activity and any opinions or, or comments or recommendations uh, to, that I expressed today are mine and do not uh, reflect my employer, uh, Marshfield Clinic Research Institute, Marshfield Clinic Health System. And um, like many people, you may have some unofficial disclosures. Um, Zelda and Wally are very quiet so far today. They're, they're peaceful and it's a fairly rainy, cloudy day uh, here in Wisconsin, which is the little red area that you see there. And so um, typically though, as you know, we've all been working from home now for, for many, many months. And uh, as soon as I start a presentation, of course the, the mail or the post shows up and the dogs go crazy. So that's just my my warning in, in case uh, we have a visit from Wally and Zelda. Um, so, so as Jan said, um, I, I've been working in this space for, for um, over 20 years, and I, I think the, the 
the research that's taking place in what we call, uh, you know, the internet um, in its broadest terms, I, I think we're really seeing just growing complexity. Um, a number of years ago, my colleague uh, Michael Zimmer and I uh, were approached to do an entry for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And so we just finished our third substantive revision um, just this year, 2021. But what I, what I was thinking about when when planning for this session is uh, is going back to the the initial uh, definition that we came up with um, back in 2011 2012 when we first put the this entry together, and and I think it still holds true um, conceptually and historically. Internet research ethics is most related to computer and information ethics. It includes such ethical issues as participant knowledge and consent, data privacy, security, anonymity, confidentiality, integrity of data. IP issues, uh, community, disciplinary, and professional standards or, or norms. And, and since this, since early work, uh, again, looking back into the, the, the 1990s even, um, some questions have, have emerged. And, and I, I kind of jokingly said so many questions uh, on this slide, but these are just some of the questions that, that we've identified over the years, uh, some early on in our, our, our first iterations of IRE uh, research. But as, as we glance at this list, um, it, it really is growing in complexity. Uh, Jan mentioned the, the, um, when we were talking earlier uh, about the uh, new J, uh, GDPR. And, you know, researchers are now facing uh, so many different um, um, complexities as we work in these different spaces. And, and I would say that the early questions, those that had to do with issues of what is what is public, what is private, those questions have certainly not gone away. And I would say they certainly haven't been uh, resolved to any great degree of, of, of confidence. And, and I would say to the contrary, many of those issues uh, that we identified way back when um, have have just grown either in intensity or or in complexity. And, and I think it's fair to say that as we think about social media, we think about big data, machine learning, AI, those those have have stirred the pot of questions and and I think now we're we're at a point where we're seeing such complex considerations in internet based internet uh, broadly speaking research that that we're pushing very very heavily back on on epistemic and and normative constraints and I think as we as our our collective interdependency on social media ha has grown over the years our relationship with trust, truth, uh, representation has also dramatically changed. And, you know, I, I, I think it's funny, we go back all the time to this, you know, silly ca uh, cartoon from the 1990s about anonymity, right? Anonymity on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. But but think about where we are now. And, and we're in this space uh, of, of we've moved from that notion of anonymity to uh, precise levels of identification, to a prospective model uh, modeling of behaviors, of, of prediction, uh, of, of prediction. And, and it almost seems seamless, right, um, that these transitions have happened, you know, from, from that space of anonymity to where we are now. And, I, and yet the ethics of the, the transition, it, they're really, the ethics are enormous. Excuse me. And um, a few years ago, I, I wrote a short response in um, in Public Library of Science, and um, we talked about. I, I was responding to an article that used a form of network network uh, social network analysis called iterative vertex clustering and classification, and IVCC. Um, and the the article was talking about using that that model uh, to identify specific populations in large data sets. And, and I went back and forth with the authors and, and you know, it was a really fruitful conversation where we talked about methods and ethics and, and how do we front load ethics in these kinds of research uh, methods. Um, it also got me thinking about the, the, the true methodological power uh, that we as researchers have at, at our disposal uh, today and, and going forward, I think that that power will increase. Um, so as researchers working in on in between uh, spaces on, on our internets today, I, we, have, we have unbelievable access to data. 
but I also want to remind our, remind us of the risks that that we also take as as researchers in these spaces. And and I think uh, you know we only need to think over uh, the past you know five to ten years of some of the the, the famous or or infamous cases of studies gone wrong to think about the the risks that possibly uh, could occur. Um, so. As, as as I read more about Jan and, and his team and, and this project, and as they engage on, on this very ambitious project, they are going to be facing a tremendous ethical, regulatory, disciplinary challenges. And and so, you know, what what does a research team do? Where do you begin when you talk about front-loading ethics? Well, in, uh, from a Western perspective, right, we would say, well, we start at the Belmont report. We think about how we treat our participants in research. We think about um, risks and harms, and we think about the, the benefits uh, of, of research and also the burdens of research. Um, but I also want to suggest that we think about uh, a, an old an old document, another old document um, on being a scientist that really talks about the values uh, that, that are um, essential to our work as scientists and, and that uh, we honor the trust that colleagues place in us, that we honor an obligation uh, to do the best work possible and to embrace productive and honest work. And then this last one, to uphold an obligation to act in ways that serve the public. And I, I think it's it's really in that last point where I was thinking about the web Im immunization project as, as really critical. And recently, I was I was talking with a, a library system about distinctions of of mis and disinformation. And so, as, as this team is starting this this project, looking at at, dis, at misinformation, um, you know what what are they going to uncover? And what I what I hope what I really hope from this team, and I have great expectations uh, for this project, is um, I, I'm hopeful that that empirical research, that empirical research looking at these forms of rhetoric, looking at empirical uh, data around misinformation, disinformation. I'm really hopeful that that's going to uh, contribute to a healthier discourse. Um, I hope our, our our citizenry is is better informed as a result of the work that's going to be done. Excuse me. OK, so just a few more comments. Um, I think we do know a lot more about the ethics of conducting internet research or, or research on Twitter um, than we did just just a few years ago. I think we've really come a long way, um, particularly from some of the work that, that Nick Proferis has done. Um, I, I think we're really starting to understand those 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 very uh, complex tensions that exist in those spaces of public and private and what do participants uh, expect. Um, there, there is a substantial literature across disciplines, but a, a trend that I've I've seen and, and I've heard uh, in many conference pre uh, presentations, and, and I think it's a little confounding um, for, for ethicists and, and for uh, for cert for some um, researchers that that there's this presumed public nature of Twitter that that's kind of become this default position. And, and I, I think we, we still need to tease that out. Um, regulatorily, I, I think that that probably is um, the correct um, framing of, of Twitter data. However, um, what about the ethics piece, right? Um, I'm also concerned about the, the ways in which uh, that public nature enables us to, you know, within, you know, an hour to, you know, get a, develop an API, operate, you know, get this API to, to, uh, to, to grab all sorts of data for us, right? It can um, enable, we can have all sorts of research projects, you know, acting very quickly. And so I, I, I said this a, a number of years ago about these spaces that the shifting research landscape is complex, that the fact that data are coming from these myriad of sources, some of them intentional and some of them unintentional. I'm concerned too around uh, about the concept of research bystanders or, or collateral subjects as, as sometimes called um, in these streams of data that, that get scooped up. Uh, one, uh, one's, one's connections in a social media landscape do matter, right? They do matter, um, even if those, those connections are distant or impersonal. Human subjects research, uh, broadly understood, um, 
is fund it is or should be fundamentally different in the age of data science. However, from a US regulatory perspective, the regulations really haven't kept up. They still haven't kept up with, with the, the age of data science, despite the rule revision in 2018. Um, methods such as IVCC rely on continuous data streams and, and continuous analytics, and many of these data mining and analytic studies would be considered um, secondary analyses. And the degree to which a researcher has access to identifiable data or the ability to ascertain information about individuals through, for example, re-identification techniques are used then as, as determinants, right, of the level of risk and benefit in the current US regulatory model. So I just wanna wrap up with a, a few words um, from a regulatory perspective. Uh, in the US, we did have a rule change in 2018. And I, I, I think a lot of researchers were, were hopeful that the revised common rule um, would address some of the technological changes taking place to some little, little degree they did. Um, I think most of us didn't quite see the, the changes that we expected. Um, but when we talk about these kinds of large data sets, um, we, we kind of have two different paths here from a US regulatory perspective. We, we either fall completely outside of the common rule definition of human subjects research, um, and that the, our definition is uh, a living individual about whom an investigator, whether professional or student conducting research, obtains information through intervention or interaction with an individual and uses studies or analyzes the information. I'm leaving out the biospecimen piece for now. Or obtains, uses studies, analyzes, or generates identifiable private information. So, so the path would be, okay, does this, does this data set, for example, comprise human subjects research? If, if not, it, it, there's, no, there's no ethical oversight, right? It's, it's outside of the purview of the ethics committee or the IRB. If we agree that it does fit that definition of, of human subjects research, the next step would be, okay, what kind of research is it? Typically, the types of research we're talking about today would qualify for what's called an exempt determination status. And, and once that determination status is, is, uh, is exempt, that means IRB oversight effectively ends. So again, we're back to a point of there's no IRB or ethics committee oversight. And, and are we comfortable with that from, from a research uh, perspective? Um, typically what we would see, we would see that research in this vein would fall into an exemption four criteria, which is um, about secondary use of identifiable private information. And, and this brings us right back to those questions that we started with, right? Well, okay, what is identifiable private information on Twitter? Is there such a thing? Or are we gonna go with that, that perspective that it is de facto public? So I, I, I leave us with that um, to think about these regulatory issues that use, use words um, uh, like when identifiable materials are publicly available. So we're back again, squarely to the public space. Is Twitter uh, writ large a public, uh, a public space? And so I, I wanna leave us with those couple of lingering questions about public and private. Um, I'm, I think we still have, uh, it's, it's great we all, this is job security, I think, because we all have so much more to, con, to, to learn about uh, um, internet research ethics writ large. And the ethics and the regulations, I, I don't ever feel that, that they're going to be completely in sync. So that puts the onus back on us as researchers operating in an unregulated space um, to do the right thing. I, I, I think it's pretty clear ethics and regulations, you know, aren't always in the same sandbox. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to my colleague, Dr. Morsey, and um, we're going to um, talk through some machine learning and some ethics. Okay. <clears throat> so I probably should request control. Yep. And I will just share my screen. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Mikolaj Moze. I work at Poznan University of Technology and the Institute of Computing Science. I work in machine learning 
and this is my role, uh, the role of, of, of me and my colleagues in this project. Uh, when asked to present during the seminar, I was thinking about what would be the most, because I knew that I would be uh, in the company of ethicists, I would be the only one not understanding what they're talking about. Um, so I've decided to, yeah, to, to at least contribute to the discussion and maybe to demystify machine learning a little bit, because uh, people tend to use this phrase machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, so vaguely, but um, it's not that complex and it's not that complicated. Uh, well, the engineers can do it, so how hard can it be? Uh, so this will be my presentation. I will look at machine learning and what can go wrong when doing research and learning and applying uh, models uh, learned or trained on uh, data uh, mostly harvested from, from the web, from open repositories, from sources such as Twitter. Uh, and we'll, in particular, we will look at what is what could go wrong? Now, why do we? Uh, why is there so so much stress on artificial intelligence or on machine learning? Now, if you think about computer science as it is or as it has been for the last fifty years, this is basically it. You take the data, you apply some kind of an algorithm to the data, and you get the results. And whether you are just typing something in your word processor, whether you are computing some equations in your spreadsheet, whether you're browsing in your browser through the internet, this is all the time what you do, right? You have the data either manually created by you or taken from somewhere. You apply an algorithm and an algorithm is just a well-defined finite set of steps that uh, bring you to, uh, to a desired goal and you, you obtain the results, right? Uh, so the algorithm here had to be written from scratch, had to be programmed. Some, someone had to write down the code that transforms and, and processes the data to produce the result. And this is when machine learning comes in, because the machine learning is indeed a revolution when it comes to ICT. Because in machine learning, this is what we do. We take the data, we show the expected results, and the algorithm is the result of what we do. So the method, the steps required to get from data to results is the result of computation itself. And that's why we no longer have to code things uh, manually. We don't have to program them. Uh, they program themselves, right? Uh, but, and that's why those methods are so data greedy. The more data you present and the more expected results you present to a machine learning model, the better the model becomes and the more accurate the, uh, the modeling of the reality or the representation of reality becomes. So this is, I understand that this is quite vague, so let's go into details and let's do some live programming. Consider a very simple example. Uh, if you were to, to teach a child to solve this kind of problem, right? given three numbers, produce the results. So a child would have to understand the concept of addition and the concept of multiplication, and maybe also the concept of which, um, uh, which formulas or which operations should be performed first and which should be performed later on. But basically, you would assume some kind of intelligence, some kind of understanding. And this is absolutely not what artificial intelligence does. Remember that we, instead of trying to encode the algorithm of solving the problem, we are trying, we are trying to derive this algorithm by just throwing lots and lots and lots of data onto the machine learning algorithm. And that's exactly how we will solve this problem. We will just create thousands of triplets, just showing three numbers and the result of this computation to a machine. And we will hope that the machine learns how to add and to multiply. So uh, now for coding. Uh, this is the only thing that I will do. I will create, I will uh, randomly select integers, so uh, integer numbers from one to, and I will put some caps so not to build, uh, so not to build uh, too large numbers. And the result will be sum up the first two numbers and multiply by the third number. And this will be the result. So this will be the input and this will be the result. So 
let's execute this one. And yeah, we are now creating 10,000 examples. Each example consists of 10 numbers, and I have limited the size of or the, the yeah, the, I've put a cap on numbers uh, on, on integers that we select to be just from 0 to 10, just for the sake of simplicity. So uh, let's see how, uh, sorry, blah, blah, blah. yeah, I've run it. So this is exactly it, right? This is just the head of this data frame. Uh, but as you can see, 9 plus 3 is 12 times 8, it's 96. Uh, 8 plus 4 is 12 times 4, 48, and so on and so on. And I've, um, I have randomly created 10,000 of such examples. And now I will just present those examples. I will keep presenting those examples to a simple neural network. So let's define the simple neural network. Um, and we will run this network for 10 epochs. An epoch is a full scan through the data set. So 10 times the data set will be read by the network and the network will try to learn how to add and to multiply, uh, mind you, without ever uh, um, explaining what an addition or multiplication is. So this is our uh, neural network. It consists of three layers. And here is the training. So just give it a second. Uh, what you are seeing there is a loss function. The loss function measures the, the steps of learning. So the, the smaller the loss, the better the learning. So you can see that we started with some random uh, knowledge or no knowledge at all. And by going through these examples, uh, you see that it goes down, goes down, goes down, goes down. Uh, well, we could continue the learning and probably would we'll go to, to much better results, but this should be enough. Let's see the results. This is the test. So this is the set of examples that the network has not seen before. And we will just show those three numbers, ask the network to provide the results, and we will compare them to expected results, so what we expect to see. So let's do exactly this. And this is our network's response. So sometimes it goes awry. And here is a huge uh, error. Uh, we've expected 24, but yeah, the network is totally mistaken. It, it gives you a 21. But other than that, doesn't look so bad, right? So uh, after a very very short time, it, it learned to uh, it learned to add. Maybe uh, I'll repeat this step. The only thing I will change is I will give it uh, a little bit more time to learn. So instead of this, let's say let's give it twice as much time. Okay, and now let's generate a new test set. And well, more or less, there is a little bit of error, but still, uh, we have some uh, some knowledge. And the subject that interests us the most in the context of this seminar is the bias. So, what happens if the training data gets corrupted in some way? And that's exactly what we will do here. So, again, I'll go back to the shorter uh, learning. So number of epochs, but now in each turn, I will change the expected results. The, uh, this array basically contains the expected values. This is in the training. This is the column that, that presented the result. So what I will do now is in every 100 elements, so we have 10,000 examples, I will modify every hundredth example. So I'll just modify 1% of the examples, and instead of having a real number there, I will just say zero. So 1% of data will be slightly corrupted, right? Instead of containing the true value, it will contain a zero. So you can already see that the training is much worse Right? The loss function does not go down, and this is, mind you, just a 1% of little error. And let's see our network. Yeah, 
and the network starts making much larger uh, errors and especially it starts veering into the negatives which it shouldn't because uh, we are adding and multiplying only uh, positive integers and so it, it should never produce a negative integer but it did what will happen if we do a much more severe uh, modification so what happens if i input there uh, just one percent of examples uh, something very, very large. So it's a clear measurement error, right? So let's see what happens now. And just by looking at the loss function now, you can clearly in, uh, expect what will happen when I try to apply this model now to the data. So these are the values that we are expecting. So. Uh, roughly 60, 25, 28, 22, and so on. And here are the responses. The model goes completely nuts. And this is by just modifying a 1% of the data. Probably we could try to do this with one tenth of a percent and still the network would go crazy. Uh, for a very, very simple task, right? For just learning how to add and multiply numbers. And uh, this is uh, nothing in compared to the complexity of the task of um, doing the uh, facial recognition or trying to model the language or trying to model the, the physicality of the world and so on and so forth. So yeah, there you have it, the bias in machine learning training, explained as, simple as, as simply as, as possible. So what is this bias? Basically, by the term bias, we mean any type of a systemic distortion of the data. Uh, we use the data in machine learning in three different ways. We use it for training the models. We use it for testing the models. So during the model training, we come up with a model. Uh, this model can have several hyperparameters, and we're trying to pick the best hyperparameters, the depth of a neural network, the architecture of individual cells in, in the neural network, the loss function being applied to the neural network. And all these are called hyperparameters. And we can use test sets just to optimize the hyperparameters. And we also need some separate uh, data set for validation. So the data that have never ever been used during the training, and this is the data that we just test the final model on just to get a glimpse of how this model will work in real life, in, in, in the wild, in production, as we say, right? And the bias, so this distortion of the data can be caused by many different, uh, many different uh, sources. Um, algorithm bias, this is something quite rare uh, because you'd have to believe that the programmers themselves want to introduce a bias into the code. Uh, this is possible, of course, you can think of uh, uh, industrial espionage, um, you can think of just someone being a jerk. Uh, yeah, sure, this is not impossible, but given all the pipelines of, of software production and all the good habits and, and best practices of software production and code reviews and so on and so forth, this is not very, very likely. Sample bias. Well, this is a very, very uh, significant source of, of bias. Uh, the data may be skewed by the method of capturing. You can rely on historical data. And this historical data, well, it has its own problems due to the fact that they reflect the world as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And in many respects, that was not the optimal world that you might want to train your data on. This may be just a stupid way of selecting the data. This may be the survival bias, right? Uh, you only see the things that survived, and these are these are the only things that you can sample. For instance, uh, if you were to build a model of how well the company will perform in a in a five years time, and you are taking the uh, for instance the uh, the information from the from the market from the last ten years most probably you will not see all the hundreds of companies that have failed and, and ceased to exist over those 10 years. You will just see those that survived. So 
they will be the best on the market. And you will be training your data on a skewed data set because it will just show you who has survived and not uh, it will not show you the characteristics uh, of all those companies that went down during, for instance, a sudden crisis. Um, this can be as dumb as um, one of the American cities uh, which came up with the idea of um, of creating a simple application for uh, for an iPhone, where it would use the gyroscope in the in the um, uh, in the phone to discover the moment that the the phone was moving in a car, and it would monitor the trembles. So whenever a sudden drop or something would appear, then the the application would assume that there is a pothole, right? And th that's why the car has suddenly. Uh, made a movement or something, and the, it would report the geolocation of the potential pothole to the to the city uh, services. Yeah, the problem was that they've developed this only for iPhones, and there is a clear correlation between your income and, by extension, to your ethnicity, uh, to the phone you have. And the city was uh, fixing the potholes, but in predominantly in in white neighborhoods, right? Um, that could also be the algorithm bias uh, here. And the measurement bias, right? Some kind of mechanical error, faulty sensor that, that was, or maybe if the data is being uh, collected by individuals, they bring their own assumptions, their own subjective judgments into the way they record the data, right? So uh, all of them, uh, all of that can be the source of, the source of, uh, uh, of bias. Um, here is an, Famous example of very, very biased system. Uh, it was the model which tries to, uh, and I am afraid that it is being used. Um, it tries to predict the probability that a person who is uh, seeking for an early release from prison will reoffend. And it's basically, uh, there was a very, very famous uh, study made in 2016 which looked at at uh, the so the problem with this model was that when it was right it was really right and it was very very correct so the precision was high of the model right whenever it made a correct prediction the prediction prediction was very precise but when it made an error uh, a false positive it made different false positives um, between different ethnicities Right? So uh, for black defendants, it, it computed a much, much higher risk of recidivism than actually uh, presented in, in the real data. And uh, exactly the same thing happened for white defendants who were predicted to pose a lower risk of recidivism than they really did, uh, which came from, from the records. Right? Uh, and it was kind of hard to find because the uh, this bias was present but only in a part of the model not in the part of the model when the model was correct because then it made exactly the same uh, or exactly precise uh, predictions for uh, white and black defendants the difference was in other prediction right so uh, kind of uh, hard to uh, hard to find uh, and ha hard to diagnose uh, problem uh, this is a beautiful example uh, and very relevant to Twitter. Uh, in two th uh, 2018, Microsoft uh, developed an artificial bot, Microsoft Tay. It was called Tay AI. Um, and basically, they've created a bot, uh, a Twitter bot, and they said it will learn from the conversation uh, with real people. So the bot had a language model. It could understand the conversations. It would learn from conversations, uh, and they've just given it to, to the whole uh, Twitter community to talk and have meaningful conversations. And at the very beginning, the very first tweet was, see you humans now sleep, so many new conversations today, thank you, so many new beginnings. Now, <clears throat> Microsoft had to pull down the service after 24 hours because this bot has not only become racist, not only misogynic, not only anti-Semite, it became an openly Nazi Hitler loving, uh, all due to the fact that people from Reddit and, and 4chan started doing conversations. And of course, there was a, an orchestrated effort to swamp 
the the bot with uh, the most offensive and most rude and most terrible um, conversations one can find uh, in the depth of the internet. But uh, yeah, these are the tweets uh, tweets generated by the bot after just 24 hours of having conversations with humans. That speaks more to the nature uh, and the state of humankind than to the uh, to the prowess of Microsoft uh, engineers, but anyway, uh, you cannot really depend on the user-generated contents, especially when the users have an agenda uh, with respect to your your AI. But it doesn't have to be so malicious. Uh, here you have uh, the location of uh, Google's office in Berlin, and as you can see here, is a terrible traffic jam. Uh, this is the street during the traffic jam, right? This gentleman here walking, he created the traffic jam. What he did, he, you see this small little trolley. This trolley was loaded with 100 active telephones, right? mobile phones. And he was just walking the streets with those phones. And uh, Google Maps was recording the location of all those phones and seeing that those phones are really slowly moving. So assuming that this is a uh, a terrible, terrible uh, congestion on the streets. It probably suggested everyone else to, to just go somewhere else and to direct the movement to nearby uh, streets, as you can see. So the guy had the street for himself. Um, this is an example of, of course, this is not malicious, this is benevolent, but still you can see how uh, a service which is very sophisticated, very complex, very large, involving hundreds and hundreds of very skilled engineers, can be uh, fooled by a guy with a small trolley and a couple of bucks to spend on, on phones or just asking his friends to borrow phones for, for 15 minutes, right? So, yeah, this can happen as well. Um, the bias, uh, the bias can be algorithmic and uh, can can be created by humans. Uh, this is uh, another infamous example of the project Greenlight in Detroit. Uh, so here you see the locations of CCTV cameras across the city, and here is the distribution of ethnicities in the city of of Detroit. And it's really hard not to see a very very certain pattern. Uh, of placing those cameras. And of course, the placement of cameras, so the placement of sensors, directly influences the selection of data, right? Because you will get the data that you get. In other, uh, in other words, if you see, for instance, if you try to use those cameras, for instance, for um, measuring, or say those cameras can measure the speed of the car, um, they will learn that only people of, of, of specific ethnicity break the speed limits in the city. Uh, not because, well, the only reason will be that this, the, the, the model trained on this data will not see other faces, right? So, uh, and you can imagine that, <clears throat> that the data collected the, the 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 moment of data collection, or even worse, the model of the the, uh, the moment of model creation is postponed by several minutes, uh, several years uh, or months from the date of the selection of places where the cameras are, and then people take the location of cameras for granted and they don't question that. They just say, okay, we have the feed from the cameras, great. So let's pull uh, the pictures and let's train our artificial intelligence models to do this and that and that. Right, but you have to go down many, many years to see where the cameras were located, why they were located where they were, and think about what what might cause uh, what what damage might be caused by such selection of of places. Uh, similarity bias again, uh, something that is present, very present in in con uh, contemporary uh, machine learning models. Um, this is something that leads to information bubbles, right? If you search Google News for an article and you and you give it some keywords, it will find articles and it will find other articles with similar headlines. And the headlines 
given a very specific selection of keywords, they will mostly corroborate a given point of view because the same facts can be reported totally differently and with different keywords, different speaking points, depending on the political affiliation of a news source. So if you are just uh, using the recommender engine and you search by similarity saying, yeah, the person wants to read this, so let's let's recommend more similar news, but similar in what sense? The similar in terms of the subject or the similar in, in terms of the form? If the latter, then probably it just enforces the information bubble because it will show people exactly the same point of view. YouTube has chosen a terrible objective objective function uh, to optimize for the total length a person spends in the uh, in the service, not on the number of videos being shown, not on the number of ads being shown, not at the quality of videos being shown, not even the similarity of videos descriptions. Right? They were just looking. They were optimizing the recommender system just to keep you as long as possible in the feed. And as a side result, and nobody programmed that. As a side result. This promoted a huge um, uh, amount of extreme content and and all kinds of conspiracy theories being displayed in those uh, videos, um, or some unforeseen consequences of aligning with stereotypes. If job adverts are uh, presented to people and they uh, present, for instance, say medical technician versus a nurse, and someone, a woman, would or could, for instance, select the nurse just by self-aligning with a stereotype of a woman doing the, the job of a medical technician is a nurse. Right? So that is quite, uh, uh, quite a problem. Uh, Underrepresentation, yeah, these are two uh, uh, extreme examples, but I just wanted to show, I was thinking whether I should show you those pictures or not, because they are very offensive. But uh, yeah, this is this happens in 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 products produced by world leading um, uh, manufacturers. This is a Nikon camera, right? And yeah, it it is supposed to be a helpful tool to suggest you to repeat the photo if someone has blinked, right? And they haven't tried. They haven't trained the algorithm for for uh, discovering people blinking on on the Asian people, right? And they are assuming that this is uh, uh, this person blinking. I mean, come on, it's really hard to be more offensive than, than that or, or not to not to mention this one. Or this was so, so famous that uh, you know, this is borderline criminal. Um, care to guess what it is? These are the results of a Bing image search by if you just type in CEO into the Bing image search, this is what you will see. Uh, how many women do you see there? One. What percentage of American companies are being led by women? 28%. And 28% of CEO positions in large companies are being currently held by women. So this result from Bing images is really something to behold. Uh, but not only images, just let's play a little bit with text. I wanted to write something and yeah, uh, we'll go from Polish to English to French to Turkish and back to Polish. So I will write now in Polish the phrase, she is a famous actress. And in French, because French also has a grammar gender, it is une actrice célèbre. So this is feminine, right? Okay, <clears throat> so now we'll go to a language that doesn't have uh, a grammatical gender. Uh, a Turkish language is an example of such language. So we go into Turkish. So now I will translate, I will switch the translation from Turkish to Polish. And now it says, is a famous actor, but actor has already a masculine 
uh, masculine ending. So it took a masculine grammatical uh, gender. So let's go back to Polish, to French, and at un acteur célèbre. Before we had an une actrice célèbre, and now we have an un acteur célèbre. Right? So woman gets uh, lost on the way because a famous actor must be a man. Um, as a matter of fact, the problem is with the translation to Turkish, uh, where you drop the, the uh, gender, uh, you drop the gender, uh, grammatical gender. But then, if you go back, you have to either reconstruct it or to you should produce at least two different um, versions, right? And not not just one. Yeah. And to close my presentation, uh, after all this, let's play a little game. Are you the source of bias? Just look at those images and imagine that you are a human annotator who is responsible for providing labels for a machine learning machine, a machine learning algorithm, machine learning task to teach a machine to automatically label images. One of those three uh, descriptions is seriously wrong. Can you spot which one? I'll give you just a second to think about it. Or maybe someone wants to propose, wants to propose the label, which is clearly wrong. Uh, I don't, I don't see anyone, so uh, I will tell you which one. And of course, it is a black woman plays with her daughter. And the problem is that it is not a black woman. It is a woman. The adjective black has nothing to do with this image. The only reason why you would like to inform a machine learning model that she is black was to contrast her with someone else on this photo, who would be, for instance, white. So a black woman talks to her white colleague. That would make sense because then the adjective would help the model to recognize between her, given her skin complexion, and the colleague who would have a lighter skin complexion. Uh, you don't see here a white man plays with a dog, right? Because you're assuming that he's a man. Yeah. So he is a man. And her color, the color of her skin in this labeling of this image, of this action, what she does with the kid, has absolutely nothing to do with, with, uh, with the action, right? And this is very, very hard to spot, especially if you're not a person of color. To spot that this, uh, this adjective is not only superfluous, it is... It is wrong because it teaches something, the model, that it should not teach, like this adjective uh, serves some purpose, and it serves no purpose in this, in this label. So it's really much, much harder than one would, one would think. OK, thank you very much. OK, um, thank you, Mikolaj. That was fascinating. Um, we are going to turn it over now to Jan, and Jan's talk is entitled uh, An Ethical Framework for Web Imm Immunization Score on Twitter. Yes, I'm just uh, trying. How it goes. Um, just please give me a second. works right now that that you can see my presentation um, and hear my voice uh, when I'm speaking so uh, uh, yes 
I'm going to talk about um, our uh, research uh, project and uh, uh, yes, uh, excuse me because I be be become a little bit distracted when I uh, try to uh, start the presentation. So I'm going to talk about ethical framework for a web immunization score on uh, Twitter. And we defined um, web immunization as individual or group susceptibility to misinformation on social media. And this uh, machine learning uh, element of our uh, of our project is, is only part of this pro of this project. And I will try to focus uh, only on 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 this on this part and try to analyze uh, ethical elements of this uh, project. But at the beginning, of course, I have to make uh, some uh, the disclaimer and disclosure. I have a conflict of interest. However, this is not a mm, financial conflict of interest. This uh, this conflict uh, is due to my double role in this project. So on the one hand, I'm a project leader. So of course, uh, my goal is to navigate our research project to the fruitful end. And I would like to uh, omit and avoid all uh, possible problems. But on the other hand, I'm a bi bioethicist interested in research ethics with a background in, in philosophy. And I would like to uh, analyze all important uh, ethical uh, problems posed by, by our uh, research project. And uh, we uh, invite you to take part in the seminar. We also in invited some external experts also uh, to avoid our blind spots to, to, to really take advantage of some outside um, perspective. Uh, when I'm, when uh, I'm going to analyze uh, our project and I will be using uh, 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 ethical framework which was elaborated by Norwegian National Ethics Committee. It, it is present in the Guide to Internet Research Ethics and, it, uh, and it, this framework consists of uh, four different dimensions that should be covered by every ethical analysis. So the first dimension is accessibility of public sphere. The second is interaction with participants. The third is sensitivity of information that is collected dur during the research project. And finally, the fourth is about vulnerability of uh, participants. So let's let's get started with the first dimension accessibility of public sphere. So it was already mentioned by by Elizabeth. We Twitter is usually considered to be a, a let's say a public sphere, and the goal of our project is to build machine learning models that will predict individual and group. Uh, web immunization score, so individual and group susceptibility to misinformation, and it will be based on their activity on social media. But in our project, we select actually to collect data from one uh, social medium from Twitter. So we will use Twitter API services to uh, collect massive amount of data and be able to estimate individual and group uh, susceptibility to miss uh, information. And of course, the first question that can be asked is do as researchers, do we have a right to collect identifiable data uh, and how our right, supposed or uh, uh, right, uh, can be related to users' uh, expectations? And uh, the data on, on, on Twitter uh, is very difficult to be de-identified or anonymized uh, because uh, every single tweet is um, connected to the whole conversation. And uh, in a tweet, not only the content of the tweet is important, but all metadata that is associated and linked to that, uh, to that tweet. So in order to to really understand the tweet, we have to connect it to other tweets, to the whole conversation. Is it just a, a sent 
standing alone tweet, response to someone, retweet, retweet with quote, who sent this tweet and mapping uh, and like uh, trying to put a single tweet into a in, into this whole context, make it all, almost impossible to the identified because we if we identify a tweet, it loses its uh, research or data potential. It it it, it becomes useless from um, uh, researchers uh, perspective. Uh, and generally, as it was mentioned uh, by Elizabeth, uh, from the regulatory point of view, of course, we are allowed to do both terms of service and development agreement of uh, Twitter allows us to collect the data and also terms of services on Twitter. They are very um, explicitly um, say that uh, Twitter is disseminating the content that uh, users are sending uh, on Twitter. Um, how, however, uh, developer agreement puts some restrictions or how this data could be used. I will I will then discuss it a little bit later. From the uh, from the federal regulatory point of view, so both from European perspective and GDPR and from US perspective from the common rule uh, of this data is considered to be more or less public and uh, uh, available for uh, research and for instance uh, article 9 of uh, GDPR says that it is not prohibited to process data which are manifestly made public and one can uh, reasonably argue that the data on Twitter are manifestly made public. However, uh, as Nicholas uh, Gold realizes, uh, Twitter uh, imposes certain restrictions on researchers and those who want to uh, use the, tw the, the data from, uh, from Twitter. And for instance, Twitter uh, forbids to reuse deleted content. Uh, and uh, that, that's why Nicholas Gold says that we should not consider uh, data on Twitter to be public data, but rather private data on public display. Uh, and we can also see that uh, Twitter users are even not aware of the fact that their like, ma ma majority of Twitter users uh, is not aware that researchers use Twitter for research sake. And uh, however, uh, quite substantial uh, percentage of uh, Twitter user would not would not opt out from research if it is uh, possible. So they um, uh, would still uh, uh, participate in research. But one third of uh, research user, as if it were uh, possible, would, would opt out from uh, from research and would not like to provide their uh, data to uh, researchers. Mm, so we are in, in, the sit in the situation when we have to somehow balance uh, the discourse of data ownership, which is uh, mostly present in the US context. And uh, in the European context, we rather think about uh, data as an inalienable per, uh, individual possession, which can be controlled by individuals and political community. But we have to also balance these two aspects with public benefits. So on the one hand, this is private data on public display, so we should also respect its private or, or the, 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 this element of control uh, of individual control, but also weighted against uh, possible public benefit. And when we talk about uh, another aspect of uh, research, in, in, in interaction with participants, in, at this uh, at this uh, stage of our project, we are not going to uh, interact with participants. Um, when, but uh, sensitivity of uh, information, uh, however, is is very important in this in this context, uh, and especially uh, important is a concept of uh, 
group privacy. So usually we um, think about privacy in terms of individual or group rights. And we even think that well-defined and self-proclaimed groups such as families, ethnic minorities, or a group, even group of patients who are diagnosed with a specific uh, conditions, that they have a certain rights that, and they can claim these rights and uh, seek justice in front of, of, uh, of a court. Uh, and this, for to, to, give an, uh, to give an example of, of such group claim, we can, for instance, uh, uh, think about uh, Havasupai tribe, that is, in bioethical context, this, uh, the, this research project was, um, uh, was quite popular to uh, discuss. So researchers violated, let's say, privacy of this uh, ethnic uh, minority of this ethnic group uh, because they use their blood samples without community uh, consent and they assessed uh, risk of mental disorders such as schizophrenia and alcoholism and uh, they also use their uh, genetic material to study their uh, their their history and uh, the genetic origin and doing so they undermined their self uh, identity beliefs and the the, the tribe recognized it as a, as a in, uh, violation of the of their group privacy and they sued the the university but when we think about group privacy in the context of machine learning we are uh, we cannot use this uh, this concept of well-defined group which ha can have certain legal representation because these groups which are formed uh, in the process of uh, machine learning when we discover certain characteristic and we can say that one individual belongs to that group one individual uh, by the way can belong to many different groups these groups uh, these individuals are not even aware of this fact they don't know that they belong to to one or many different groups and uh, they don't have any kind of representation but still they can uh, be a subject of certain algorithmic intervention and because they don't have knowledge about this intervention they cannot seek redress uh, before the courts and um, uh, they are not recognized by the uh, legal system. And uh, one thing that that uh, has to be mentioned also that uh, to, uh, that the concept of group privacy is very closely related to profiling. And Twitter uh, developer agreement explicitly uh, prohibits uh, profiling. So the Twitter the development agreement says that targeting, segmenting or profiling individuals based on sensitive personal information like health, negative financial uh, situation and so on uh, cannot be uh, cannot be used by uh, those who use tw Twitter API. Uh, so right now we have to ask, we, we are facing three, uh, let's say, ethical questions. So the first question is how uh, we should treat Twitter uh, development agreement. Is, is this uh, agreement legally binding or ethically binding for, for us? Mm, do we uh, really exhaust uh, and meet definition of, uh, of profiling in our research project? And how we are going to uh, protect group uh, privacy, how, how we are thinking about uh, protection of, of, of group privacy. So the first question, how, uh, how important is from ethical and from legal perspective uh, Twitter agreement with uh, developers? So from the legal perspective, um, the, the, there is already some case law which uh, indicates that this uh, kind of agreements are recognized, at least in, by the uh, American uh, justice uh, system. Uh, however, I think that there are quite strong ethical arguments which can say that uh, in certain circumstances, this agreement 
can be, let's say, uh, violated or overridden. So uh, companies such Twitter, Google, Facebook uh, have a very strong uh, uh, influence on our politics, uh, not only on elections, but also on uh, discourse uh, and political uh, discussions. Uh, and I I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, a democratic society has has to have some some instruments. Has ha, have to has to uh, oversee in, uh, their actions. And researchers are probably best situated to really uh, put a check on this on these companies and and uh, uh, examine their uh, activities. However, of course, this kind of research projects should be carefully. Uh, overseen and reviewed by external uh, ethics uh, committees and also should have uh, legal support from re from research institutions. And of course, uh, right now I, I want to stress and emphasize that we are not going to, to violate a Twitter uh, agreement and this is not what we what we are thinking we are doing in, in, in our uh, research uh, project. So what is the definition of, uh, of uh, profiling? So profiling is a technique to automatically process personal and non-personal data aimed at developing predictive knowledge. Mm, uh, and that knowledge subsequently be applied as a basis for decision making. So I think that, that we have to uh, draw attention to these two elements. So on the one hand, predictive knowledge, on the other hand, decision making. And of course, our project aim is to create predictive knowledge, but uh, we are not going to make any intervention about these individuals, which let's say provide us with, with the data. However, we are very aware of the fact that this data could be used in, in that way. How, however, we want and, um, perform any kind of intervention um, at this stage of the project and every future intervention would be uh, coupled with um, informed consent uh, process. What about vulnerability of uh, participants? So the last uh, dimension of uh, our analysis and vulnerability usually in the context of biomedical research uh, refers to the to, to to the moment when we involve uh, participants into a research project, and those who have some kind of cognitive and le uh, cognitive and those people who who do not have sufficient cognitive capability or who don't have legal capacity are usually um, unable to make informed decision about themselves, and they are recognized to be uh, vulnerable. In the context of biomedical uh, research, but uh, I think that the, 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 uh, this concept of vulnerability really doesn't apply to our research uh, project. Also, because we are not going to obtain informed consent from from uh, our par participants, from the Twitter um, users. S however, I think that uh, we that our uh, that some of our uh, participants are vulnerable in that situation because uh, I think that susceptibility to misinformation can be understood in terms of vulnerability. So people who have diminished ability to make autonomous decision in the information environment of social media are vulnerable in this in this uh, circumstances and those who cannot recognize uh, misinformation and who spread this misinformation are vulnerable in information environment. So what about protection? I said that uh, informed consent in our project would be very impractical and we are uh, also from the regulative perspective is, is not required. However, uh, Neil Dickert and, 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 and his colleagues uh, in a very interesting article published in American uh, Journal of Bioethics uh, recognize that informed consent uh, is a procedure that has a lot of different functions. Actually, 
they distinguish between seven different functions of informed consent. And this function can be also realized by other procedures or other um, or other actions. So for instance, one of, of the function of informed consent is to make the process of research transparent. And by being present on social media and also disseminating information on our, uh, on our research project, we are going to, let's say, to try to meet this element, uh, this function of in, in, informed con con consent. So we would like to inform, uh, let's say, Twitter's sphere that we are conducting this kind of research and uh, what it means for, for, for Twitter users. Another form of protection that we are uh, thinking about is uh, uh, limited data sharing, especially when we talk about this data sets that contains data from, uh, from Twitter and the model that will uh, uh, allow us to predict the uh, web immunization score of individual and groups because we don't want we don't want this model to be used by any bad actors to for instance target susceptible individuals and groups with disinformation so uh, we were thinking about some kind of data access committee uh, that will limit and vet the uh, data requests and also we will not um, share the very model of, uh, of data, but only a su surrogate model, which allows to validate our research, but which doesn't allow to, um, for instance, to, to, to replicate and to target uh, vulnerable uh, individuals. And generally, I think that uh, our research project, of course, there is a lot of uh, um, ethically let's say sensitive issues i think that that we rather uh, that that one of the uh, ethical uh, uh, laws of information ethics which was formulated by um, floridi which says that entropy ought not to be caused in the infosphere is is justification for uh, for our for our pro project we want to limit misinformation and this is also uh, uh, how we serve, let's say, public uh, interest doing this research. So we are not doing this uh, for just for fun or just out of pure curiosity. OK, thank you very much. OK, thank you, Jan. We're going to turn it over to Nick Proferis. One second. All right, can you see my screen? Yep, we're good. Okay, excellent. Uh, so thank you all very much for having me here today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk with this group. Um, and thank you very much for um, the <laughs> opportunity to also uh, reconnect with Dr. Buchanan. Dr. Buchanan, uh, of course, was one of my very early mentors uh, in my uh, PhD. So it's it's a real pleasure to be here, and, and hopefully I, I do her proud. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, Twitter research ethics and thinking about ethics uh, sort of beyond the review board. Um, and my talk is broken down into uh, three parts. Uh, so I'm going to move essentially from quite broad uh, into sort of a specific uh, example. So I'm going to start today by talking about uh, ethics very generally, what we mean by ethics and the use of publicly available data in relationship to these different meanings. Next, I'm going to talk about uh, some research that I've been involved in, uh, in terms of understanding how researchers themselves uh, are going about their ethical practices uh, when using data from Twitter and talking about a little bit about the gaps between what researchers do and what users actually think happens to their data and some of the problems uh, therein. And then third, I'm going to talk about a very specific example of values tensions uh, that exist in relationship to data sharing uh, around Twitter and some of the uh, tensions between 
what we're uh, sort of required to do by rules and regulations and what our uh, ethics may demand and how we might be able to go about practically solving some of these issues. So I wanna to start today um, by thinking uh, really, really big about what is ethics? Uh, why do we care about this stuff? And um, you know, when I, when I teach my undergraduate students uh, in my information technology class about ethics, you know, I, I go back to this idea, this very old idea that's been with us a very, very long time, that ethics are systems of principles that we use to guide us in making moral evaluations. And we can rely on things like utilitarianism, uh, to help guide us in terms of making decisions and evaluating decisions based on um, what's going to provide the, the maximum good. Um, we can look at something like uh, Kantian deontology, which is going to you know, suggest that we should evaluate a given action based on uh, what our duties are in that particular circumstance. Um, and we actually might ask uh, not just about act evaluation, but also about character ethics, uh, virtue ethics, for example, is going to act, uh, ask us and help us reflect on uh, the kinds of people that we want to be. Are we instilling the kinds of values in ourselves and in our actions that are virtuous? Um, and at their core, these uh, ethical principles are really, and, and systems, are really about using our capacities for reason, judgment, and thought to critically examine our own actions and our own character. And so I really want us to keep this idea in mind, right? That ethics is about, in part, using our capacities for reason and judgment to think through our actions. Now, as researchers, um, we often talk maybe uh, colloquially about ethics as sort of that regulatory piece, that compliance side of things, right? Maybe you're having a hallway conversation with a colleague and you say, oh yeah, you know, I have to do the, um, the ethics piece of my project now, right? Going through the IRB, getting the paperwork for informed consent approved. Um, certainly I go through this. I'm sure all of you go through this with, with your work as well. This is about a process of ensuring conformity with relevant laws, policies, and guidelines. And of course, these laws, guidelines, and policies are developed in relationship to particular ethical principles uh, that, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Buchanan uh, mentioned at the very beginning, you know, respecting human dignity and autonomy, maximizing benefit, minimizing harm. So you can see the trace there of utilitarianism thought uh, in that particular value, uh, justice and beneficence. Um, now ethics as compliance is really about ensuring that researchers don't violate certain sort of uh, baseline conditions, um, you know, for the treatment of others essentially, right? These were set up to make sure that researchers do not violate what I would call uh, flooring level um, needs to make sure that people don't you know, violate the basic conditions for how we should behave towards one another. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is the end of our ethics though. And in fact, uh, compliance and contemplation uh, may not necessarily be playing in the same sandbox as, as Dr. Buchanan reminded us. Uh, sometimes uh, compliance doesn't cover ethical situations uh, that we may encounter as part of our scientific research practices. And very often when using public data uh, on, from social media sites, uh, we're getting more and more, um, you know, we're getting better policies today than we had say a decade ago, that, uh, but there's still incredible gaps where the rules and policies, uh, you know, that were developed for the biomedical setting uh, may not apply cleanly uh, to the context of uh, the um, social media uh, using public data. And part of this is because, at least in the U.S., um, and, and I'm not an expert on uh, EU policy, so I have to apologize there, um, but in the U.S. at least, uh, public data is often not considered to be, uh, the use of public data is often not considered to be uh, research involving human subjects and therefore not subject to the kinds of oversight of um, institutional review boards. But again, this is not to say that these, um, these uh, research projects lack ethical components. Um, it's simply to say that they fall out of the purview sometimes of the compliance side of ethics. And uh, I want to make the argument here 
that ethics and our ethical reflections and our actions um, uh, and, and evaluation uh, of our actions needs to be considered across the entire process of doing research. And certainly there are in fact a litany of uh, ethical quagmires that we may encounter. Uh, these can happen during the data collection process, the data use process, uh, and the data sharing process. Uh, so the entire gamut of uh, the research process essentially. So it, certainly in terms of data collection, we might think about, uh, for example, uh, data that was perhaps public once, but it's now been deleted. We, there may be ethical questions about how we should treat that data. Um, we might be using the, uh, uh, the, the data uh, from marginalized groups. It may be public data, uh, but, these, but we know that there's been overburdening of particular populations. Uh, and so even when we're using the public data, um, you know, we still may have obligations uh, because of the historical injustices on those groups. Um, aggregation of data points to create a uh, very detailed picture of someone's life uh, can be a threat to someone's privacy and may have ethical dimensions. And there's questions that we should ask about even when it is uh, public data, if someone contacts you and says, I would like my data removed from your data set, uh, whether or not we should honor that request. As part of data use, uh, we might encounter questions about the actual ends of our project. Um, so a really interesting example, actually, in just the past couple of weeks, uh, researchers at the University of Minnesota had a project uh, that uh, fell out of the compliance side of, um, of, of uh, oversight, where it was not considered to be uh, you know, research involving human subjects, but where they were purposely introducing errors uh, into uh, the Linux kernel in order to study whether or not um, the, research, the uh, development community would actually find those errors. But, so we can, we can recognize that there's some serious ethical issues about, for example, purposely uh, introducing errors into a system that you know, thousands upon thousands of people rely on, even if the IRB says, oh, it, it's not research involving um, uh, human subjects review. And sometimes we also see, you know, I, I also like to use the example sometimes of projects that scoop up lots of public uh, image set data to do things like use images, uh, pictures of people's faces to, to try to predict their political leanings or try to predict sexuality. Um, and some people have labeled this as sort of phrenology 2.0, right? Obviously has severe ethical implications, even though it's public data. Um, an important thing uh, that's actually come up really recently that I, I, I do want to particularly encourage this group to think about as they're studying misinformation and disinformation um, that's been actually that's come up in the context of research around uh, Gamergate is not just thinking about your obligations towards your research subjects, but also thinking about your obligations to your fellow researchers and to, for example, your students. Um, if you are studying vitrolic content, content that uh, could be psychologically harmful, um, you know, that may, maybe it's violent information, maybe it, it is uh, disparaging information, uh, finding ways to make sure that students or your fellow researchers have the kinds of support mechanisms they need uh, to be able to uh, engage with this work um, and, and have, you know, essentially uh, support if if they're feeling harmed themselves by the kinds of content that you're analyzing. And then finally, in terms of data sharing, there's some really serious ethical questions around how we represent our data subjects. Uh, so for example, the power of labeling. Uh, so um, an example might be something like if we create a data set and we label this data set uh, tweets from people that we think have depression, and then uh, make this publicly available, right? The way that we're representing that data subject, uh, those individuals can have implications uh, for them. Uh, and so, you know, we have to be re uh, reflective of the implications of um, how we represent our, our subjects. Certainly in terms of data sharing, we also wanna think about things like other ways of sharing our research outputs with the communities that we're actually studying. Uh, this can, you know, obviously have a lot of benefits um, for the researchers in terms of developing connections, but can also be a question of, around justice. 
And then finally, um, you know, certainly when we're thinking about upholding values for, for science, uh, replicability is a really big ethical issue. We want to make sure that the work we're doing is valid, that uh, it's, re it's reproducing, and that we can benefit science and human knowledge going forward. So the thing I really want to emphasize in this first part is that there's no singular ethics portion of a research project, right? It's not just something that you do up front. It's a process of continuous evaluation of our actions, of our character, um, where we weigh our values and duties. Um, and I'll point very briefly to a framework that I think is, is very useful in helping us uh, go through that sort of continuous process of evaluation about maybe conflicting values or duties or values and duties or, that are intention or tensions between the what we're asked from a compliance side and what we may uh, feel from a, you know, a contemplative side. And that is the process of, of using disclosive ethics. Um, this is a framework put forward by Philip Bray uh, that asks us to sort of uh, continually uh, in, engage in a descriptive process of, of what the values tensions are or where there's gaps um, that we're noticing between uh, different values um, and uh, a normative component, how we then go about actually addressing those gaps once we have described them in full. So I wanna pivot now to getting a little bit more specific. Uh, so that was sort of my broad introduction to thinking about ethics and questions in relationship to the use of uh, public data. I wanna talk now about Twitter specifically. So uh, obviously uh, Twitter has become a major source for academics. Uh, there's been over 2000 research papers published in the past three years uh, using Twitter data. Projects obviously uh, are, include sometimes billions of tweets now. And we certainly uh, have a reliance on Twitter, not just because it's become a very dominant uh, space um, you know, for political discourse, uh, for responding to events, um, but because also it is easy to get the data there, uh, because, relatively speaking, and because the data that we can actually get is uh, a kind of data that we can digest very easily. It's a kind of data that is very easily um, parsable for machine learning applications. Uh, textual data is obviously much easier to, to process than uh, image-based data, um, other kinds of video content, um, and so and to make inferences from it. And because comparatively, it is relatively public. Now I have public there in scare quotes um, and I'll unpack that a little bit in just a minute. Um, and I wanna make note that um, as part of a research project I, I did with Michael Zimmer um, uh, about five, six years ago, uh, we looked at research that had published using data from Twitter and found very few of these projects actually report about going through ethics review. Now, that isn't to say that they didn't, but only about 4% of the published research that we were, that we were able to find uh, actually talked about going through IRB or talked about their ethics processes. Um, and I actually do wanna emphasize that I do think it's quite important that we talk about our ethics, that we include it as part of publications uh, and include that sort of descriptive component in our evaluation of it. So I wanna talk for just a second um, about uh, a research project that I was involved with, with Dr. Casey Feisler uh, at UC Boulder, uh, where we sort of recognize that Twitter um, data is becoming more and more prominent uh, in terms of its use uh, in the academic setting. And we kind of had the question, well, well, what's the other side think, right? Do users actually know their content is being used for academic study and how do they feel about it? So we surveyed Twitter users, asking users whether or not they think that researchers are allowed to use their content with, without having to get reconsent. And then we uh, started asking them questions about their level of comfort with the idea of their tweets being used for research. And uh, in particular, we were trying to understand sort of the contextual factors that might drive users' level uh, of comfort with the idea of uh, their content being used or used in different ways, um, such as whether or not they were asked for permission by the researcher, uh, the kind of study it was, um, the kinds of content that were being uh, analyzed, um, and whether or not they were, for example, quoted uh, directly in the study or indirectly. Um, so uh, the top line statistics that I thought were really striking were that we found over 60% of uh, our respondents actually thought researchers were forbidden 
by Twitter's terms of service from using uh, public tweets without having to ask the users for their permission. That is not the case. Uh, this is an incorrect understanding. Um, now we asked, we, we told them uh, after this question that actually they are allowed to do it, but would you like them to get your permission? And uh, 65 roughly uh, percent uh, of our respondents thought that researchers shouldn't be allowed to use tweets without permission or without having to go back and ask the user. However, and this is the thing I do wanna emphasize that many users are actually somewhat comfortable with the idea of their content being used if asked, if they can see the research outputs, but this is extremely contextually driven. Um, so I'm not gonna sit here and read this entire chart for you, um, but I want to emphasize and just try to give you a quick read of what's going on here. So um, these are the different contextual factors that we asked about on the left-hand side at the top. This is a uh, essentially a Likert scale between uh, very uncomfortable on the left-hand side here and on the right-hand side, very comfortable. And scores in darker blue uh, are, are higher prominence. So uh, for example, um, users are very uncomfortable uh, with the idea of their, um, their content being used and never being told about it. Researchers, um, excuse me, users are very uncomfortable, uh, over 50% over in, in indicated they would be very uncomfortable with uh, someone using their tweets from a protected account, which is a kind of privacy that you can uh, invoke on Twitter uh, that controls uh, the, um, the distribution of your tweet. Um, people were very uncomfortable with the idea of uh, someone, a researcher, using a tweet that you'd created, even if it was public, but that you had later deleted. Um, now, where we do see increasing levels of comfort, actually, and I think this is kind of interesting, uh, is the idea that um, you know, if, if my tweets are being used in a big data set, maybe I'm a little bit more okay with that. Uh, so for example, um, people were much more comfortable with the idea of if I was just one, you know, one person in the scope of a, of a research study that's studying you know, a billion tweets, I'm a little bit more um, comfortable with that than a situation in which a researcher is only studying a few dozen tweets or a few dozen people. Um, interestingly, uh, users are much more comfortable with the idea of, uh, of an algorithm uh, analyzing their tweets rather than a human, um, which, is, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, folks are very uncomfortable with, their, with the idea of uh, researchers using not just your tweets, but also other information in tandem with tweets. So for example, public profile information, such as location and username. And um, folks are pretty uncomfortable with the idea of uh, being uh, quoted in a research study uh, with their Twitter handle um, uh, attributed to that quote. They're a little bit more comfortable with the idea of their tweets being used uh, in studies uh, if they're attributed anonymously. Right, so there's some interesting contextual findings here, uh, but the big sort of things I want to draw our attention to are what I think are potentially tensions in some of this, uh, some of these results. So users' understandings of how the researchers are actually using their data are, are pretty limited, in, in my view, based on this data. Um, but they do have contextually driven uh, levels of comfort, which I think are important to acknowledge and to understand their perspective. Um, at the same time that we, we recognize you know, from this data that there's some serious gaps in users' understanding, it's also important for us as researchers to promote certainly the progress of science and values that sort of, again, serve that wider public of, of addressing misinformation and abuse that are happening at a much more macro level. And um, you know, one of the one of the things that people have talked about, for example, is well, is there a way that we could perhaps think about notifying uh, users when we're using their data for research? Uh, but in some situations, actually, that notification process itself could cause users uh, more anxiety uh, that they're being watched or being studied than actually no notification. Uh, and so, I just want to point out here that there's different tensions at play, and it's really important to describe this space in order to understand these tensions. So again, so I'm moving now from, from really broad, talking about ethics and public data, 
to talking about Twitter, to talking now about a very specific context, which is uh, data sharing and exploring some of the tensions in relationship to data sharing on Twitter. So obviously in terms of the progress of science, a very important part of upholding uh, scientific truth is ensuring the validity of our work. Uh, that's part of and also ensuring public trust. A big way that we do that is by providing our data um, and providing our methods uh, uh, in order to try to um, create opportunities for rec uh, replicability studies. Uh, and this is really important. Obviously, there's been a lot of concern about a crisis of, rep of replicability uh, in scientific research, uh, particularly in the social sciences uh, in the past decade or two. Now, in this particular situation, thinking about the context of uh, Twitter data, one way that we can enhance the sort of benefit uh, in, to the broader community, scientific community, is by making our data sets available for use by others. But there are some tensions here, obviously. On the compliance side of thing, uh, Twitter's terms of service forbids us from sharing the full JSON data. So this is the full uh, data uh, of a tweet. Uh, so we, we would actually be essentially told that we cannot actually provide the content of a tweet in, in terms of resharing. Uh, certain metadata fields we're not allowed to share. Um, Twitter's terms of service actually only allows for researchers uh, to share with third parties uh, the tweet IDs themselves. Further, our local laws may or may not allow resharing of data. And at the same time, uh, we also might be asked by our funders. Uh, so for example, National Science Foundation uh, might ask me to uh, share my data uh, as part of trying to ensure open science practices, right? So we already have tensions just in the compliance side of things. From the sort of ethical contemplation side of things, we realize that you know, users themselves may not want to be in a labeled data set. Again, think about a labeled data set of you know, tweets that we think are from people who based on the sentiment of their tweets, we think may be prone to depression, right? Labeling someone in this way could have implications for their, for their privacy if I can look up a tweet ID and then be able to see the user that it came from. We also might ask about whether or not there's an even distribution of risk uh, that's being shared among the population uh, in relationship to the population that was studied. Again, thinking back to um, uh, situations in which there's marginalized groups uh, that have historically already been overburdened uh, or have had injustices committed against them in relationship to scientific research. And then uh, we also, uh, from the contemplative side of things, also have to think about, well, you know, we still want to uphold open science, the validity of our work, what happens if data starts disappearing from uh, this data set? So a researcher at the University of Maryland, Ed Summers, did a project uh, not too long ago where he looked to see how much content from uh, a, a data set had been deleted after a year uh, after um, uh, an event and found that uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of his data set was gone, essentially. Uh, where users had simply just deleted that content uh, after the event occurred, right? And that really threatens our ability to recreate an event, to understand a particular social phenomenon, right? So we have a lot of different tensions here. It's really important for us to describe these tensions and think about ways that we might go about solving these tensions. So I want to draw your attention to uh, one project, the Documenting the Now project, um, which has developed a, a set of code that they call the hydrator that lets researchers easily rehydrate, uh, grabbing all of that uh, extra JSON data from Twitter's APIs simply based on a list of tweet IDs. So this is a piece of code that helps sort of address the fact that uh, Twitter's um, uh, terms of service requires us to do one thing, uh, but that we may you know, feel, feel uh, that is in tension with uh, questions around uh, you know, difficulty of, of uh, actually going about doing this process. Um, certainly, we want to think about in terms of data sharing, finding ways to anonymize user data when possible, particularly if it's potentially sensitive content or if we're doing a kind of sensitive labeling um, of uh, a data set. We might think about uh, ways of addressing these tensions by doing things like making our data sets available 
uh, only by request uh, or setting up specific kinds of resharing agreements. So there is a, uh, a series of data sets um, called the E-Risk data sets, which is a, um, a data, set of data sets used for developing better um, uh, machine learning models for doing things like uh, predicting self-harm, uh, predicting depression. Um, and these, uh, this is a, a set of tweets uh, from individuals that have been, uh, have a baseline uh, where they have indicated that they have had a positive, for example, diagnosis uh, of a particular um, uh, uh, mental state or have had a uh, positive case of self-harm. And essentially that's the, the ground truth that they're operating against. Um, and so this uh, data set, uh, you can get access to it, but you can only get access to it uh, by request. And there's a specific user agreement that the researchers have set up um, with terms to limit what researchers can actually then go and do with this data set. And the data set itself has been scrubbed already of, of as many identifiers as they can possibly, they think, uh, realistically scrub from it. But the um, but the terms of service that the researchers have set up for reuse also uh, includes terms like um, making sure that future uses can't try to positively identify, you're forbidden from trying to re-identify the individuals uh, from whom this content originated. Um, you're forbidden from resharing this. Um, so thinking about ways of setting up your own terms for, for data sharing uh, is one way of trying to address it, of the tensions. And then finally, the thing I wanna come back to is document your decision-making, um, discuss your decision-making. One of the big difficulties of uh, coming up with ethical um, uh, standards in this space is the fact that very often we don't report uh, our ethical thinking and our ethical decision making as part of our uh, uh, part of our publication practices. Getting to a point where we talk about our norms and normalize them is critically important for this space. So again, uh, you know, our ethical evaluation needs to be a continuous process through. Uh, research, the entire research process from A to Z, and we need to document that and discuss it. Um, I will leave with uh, this note that uh, certainly the Association of Internet Researchers uh, has been thinking about uh, this uh, you know, particular uh, ethical questions involving internet research, the use of public data for decades. Um, and they've uh, published two ethical decision-making guides um, that are available online. The thing I really like about these guides is that the, it's not a compliance side model that if you just do these things that you will be okay. Um, it really is a series of prompts that are set up to um, help us think through the particular uh, challenges that we might have as part of doing our practices. So it's really help us, it's really there to help us think out uh, potential situations. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you. That's great. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Mikolaj. Thank you, Jan. Um, we do have time for some questions. Um, let me just check the, the chat real quick. Um, I see, hi, Natasha. Um, I, I see your question. Uh, I wanted to ask about the expectations of internet users. Uh, sorry, I lost you. Uh, expectations of internet users, the public visibility of online research projects, and disconnect between users' expectations and the reality of online data collection and use. Uh, do the project team see it as a part of their ethical responsibility to try and educate internet users about what is happening to their data? And how might this be achieved when consent is not being sought um, without alienating users, as, as Nick just said? So, uh, Jan, do you want to start with that and then we'll move across? Yes. Um, yes, I'm, 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 think, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, about uh, this, uh, this question. I was uh, um, a little bit, <laughs> again, distracted with the, the with uh, with my video so uh, i i hope that you can uh, hear me um 
Yes, I, w I was I was thinking, of course, about uh, internet users' uh, expectations. I was also um, thinking about their expectations from a little bit of the different point of view, because for for a while I was uh, I was very much fo focused on ethical aspects of using of electronic health re records. And there is already a lot of research, and especially focus groups with patients who are asked about their attitudes to uh, using their uh, electronic health records in in research. And usually pe people at the beginning of the of the con on the on, on the conversation, they are not feeling very comfortable with with research use uh, of their um, uh, of their health records, but when they are informed about uh, possible health benefits and about uh, the all uh, privacy protections, uh, then there are, became more and more willingness to share the electronic health uh, data, especially if they have a certain condition. So uh, my uh, I was always very curious about uh, Let's say if we are asking a certain questions, uh, just and we are using certain instruments to 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 measure uh, uh, users' attitudes. Sometimes we can uh, we we will not let's say help users to really evaluate their 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 answer. So of course I take. Uh, this into uh, consideration, and it, it's it's a real concern that that people are really reluctant about um, about uh, sharing their data, and they treat research with a huge suspicion. Uh, and yes, um, and what what we of course what we want to do, we want to be as much uh, as possible. Uh, as transparent as it is uh, possible, and also this kind of seminar is, is is our effort to make our our research project visible, and uh, we will be of course in informing and explaining, uh, uh, and 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 here I see that uh, uh, there is a um, that there is also a part of question. Uh, about about uh, consent that let's say it's it's in, in, impossible because we have to contact hundreds of thousands of users and th that will be impossible to physically process we don't have uh, time and resources to really uh, provide this uh, this information and mostly when people are asked uh, to participate in this kind of re is the, in this kind of research. Um, they can even consider, for instance, asking them as a form of intrusion. The, the, uh, then they don't have any obligation to respond to our uh, uh, invitation to even uh, read the, the informed concept. From, so from the organizational point of view, uh, it is impossible to really uh, conduct research with machine learning and asking for informed consent. I, 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 I don't I, know, Miko, maybe you can also add something uh, about 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 this. No, not really. I think I think this covers uh, basically your uh, your task. Um, I really, first of all, uh, I don't think we are touching upon such a private and and directly vulnerable feature of people. I mean, of course, their vulnerability to fake news is a vulnerability, but it's not a direct vulnerability that can be very easily, um, very easily uh, used by by an adversary. Um, besides, we already had uh, discussions about uh, how to uh, present the results of the project. For instance, uh, we both with, um, with Jan agreed that uh, probably publishing all the models that we, were de we will be developing is not, uh, not a good idea. 
that maybe we will just publish uh, surrogate models, uh, so models of models instead of detailed ordinary ordinary models that would allow you to score a given individual against the vulnerability. So yes, this is an ongoing and fascinating, and for me especially, a fascinating discussion because this is the first time in my life that I'm having those discussions. And uh, it's not something that in a technical and ICT uh, communities is, uh, at least not to a recent, not, not until recently, uh, this conversation uh, has not been going on very much. And now it is, uh, yeah, we're catching up with the rest of the civilized civilized world <laughs> regarding the ethics. So hopefully we will catch you guys. Yeah, and just to respond back to Natasha's question too, in, in the US, um, in the regulatory framework, we actually have a word that we use that getting consent from that many individuals would be impracticable. And so it, it sets it outside of the, the parameters of, of a typical informed consent process. Um, okay, um, there's another question. Um, I can read it. During the pandemic, many researchers uh, performed ad hoc analyses of Twitter without any ethical consideration. Uh, who just entered this area of, of research recently. Uh, could you talk something about this phenomena? Uh, to prepare a study protocol, you need a lot of time. So especially in the beginning of the pandemic, some investigations could violate some standards. Uh, does anybody have any specific examples of that happening? Mm, I don't uh, know any specific uh, example that I can uh, discuss. But um, let's say usually, usually when we talk about uh, normal biomedical research during this kind of emergency uh, situations, you, usually the, 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 the review protocol uh, is uh, performed in, in a very, let's, let's say, expedient way. So uh, it, it is shortened and it, it is uh, it, it, it is usually not a full uh, full uh, review. Sometimes even this kind of uh, protocols are reviewed in advance, so they are they just wait for for uh, for the pandemic to be uh, to, to be uh, to be launched and and uh, and and re and review. And I have to admit, and th this is also the why we why we are organizing this uh, this seminar that uh, online research um, on twitter is also very new for me so i'm i'm, I'm also learning uh, what are the ethic what are specific uh, ethical standards for 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 twitter uh, for twitter uh, research and ad, because ad, ad, ad it was mentioned b before the regulatory from the regulatory point of view researchers do not violate any specific regulations and uh, even from the perspective of, of a bio researchers all these restrictions uh, that could be imposed by additional uh, reviews or uh, or consents uh, forms or something like that could uh, could even seem to be a little bit uh, excessive because right now that the, 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 there is a discussion uh, within let's say bioethical community how to facilitate uh, ethical reviews how to uh, uh, loosen uh, ethical restriction and allow researchers for self regulation and uh, as uh, elizabeth uh, mentioned uh, common rule was quite recently um, uh, upgraded and uh, revised and the expectations from 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 the biomedical uh, researchers were that uh, even that this uh, that the self regulating aspect will be e taken into consideration even to, to the greater uh, extent that that, uh, that it was because uh, uh, right now, uh, in in uh, in bioethics and in biomedical uh, research ethics, we discuss uh, rather, and this is phrase uh, taken directly from the article uh, written by Tom uh, Beecham, that over protection, over regulation, leads, especially in this kind of studies of 
uh, emergency pandemic studies to over uh, to under protection. So over regulation and over protection leads actually to under uh, protection. But I'm not sure if we can use exactly the same logic to internet uh, research. Uh, uh, and I think that generally uh, uh, internet researchers are in a very right now in a very nice position because I don't think that there is any pressure from the regulatory uh, point of uh, view to, to, to really tighten the regulation, but they have, a, uh, I think that they have an opportunity to self-regulate themselves and to set this ethical standard by, uh, by themselves. Also, in order to build trust with uh, with participants, with user, with those who produce uh, data, I don't know what is your op opinion ab about that. Uh, and I uh, now I'm asking about uh, Nicholas and, and, and uh, El Elizabeth. <clears throat> Nick, do you well, want? I think that, yeah, I was I was. I was going to try to tie the this question to the to the previous question a little bit too, in terms of thinking about you know ways that we can try to enhance public knowledge um, as a way to sort of mitigate some of these some of these issues. One way is certainly by thinking about if not getting informed consent up front, um, certainly informing users still after the fact, <clears throat> and so uh, doing things like sharing research outputs with. Uh, you know, our participants is a really good way of trying to let them know that this is happening, to let them see, uh, uh, you know, the outputs of this work and to try to build that sort of that trust, um, you know, with that participant uh, community. I mean, I think certainly in terms of, uh, you know, questions about, uh, you know, there's an event and you have to respond to it quickly. And, you know, you have to, you know, it's really important to maybe start the data gathering before you've necessarily done, um, you know, the full compliance side of, of the ethics portions. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, obviously if there's a real expedience to, to data collection and there's sort of an immediate, uh, you know, intangible uh, impact and severity of it, you know, that's, you know, I think that it's real important to start those processes and be in coordination with you know the IRB or the Ethics Review Board or whatever it is, as soon as humanly possible, and let them know. I mean, there are certainly ways, and, and IRBs have encountered this before, of where you you know you started the data collection and you're contacting them to you know get approval. Starting data collection, I should say, of public data, and you're you're contacting them you know at the in parallel to say to, to get the process rolling. I think that's really important. Um, you know, to make sure that you, you, if there is an expedience to the data collection, it, it happens in tandem with uh, the compliance side of things. Yeah. I, and I, I want to just have a, a different take on, on the question and the, this conversation in that at, at what better time um, is there than, than right now to be doing research, right? I mean, think about the, 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 um, the discourse right now around uh, every day we're, we're hearing about clinical trials, we're hearing about, you know, phase one trials, phase two, when we're talking about vaccines and the development. And so it's it seems to me that this year has almost been a crash course in public health education, right, for the whole world. Um, and, it, and it shows both, uh, you know, some of the great things about our, our public health systems. And, and of course, it's shown where where things have are really really terrible um, for for many many communities many individuals um, where the public health systems have have truly fallen and, and so I I think a, as researchers it's almost like you know this is this is our heyday right like we have an opportunity to be talking about our ethics our research I mean you know I, again I can't think of a better time and and either in the in the context of internet research or, or outside of it uh, I I do think uh, re research ha has be has become uh, uh, you know very common we're, we're all talking about it right now and uh, I, so perhaps it's it's the perfect time you know in the perfect storm we, we take opportunity right um, 
if I if I could, if um, we have we have about ten minutes or so left, I had one question that that I wanted to hear from all three of you, um, and and it got me thinking, Nick, uh, when you showed the data uh, about uh, people's comfort levels when their tweets were analyzed by a by a by a computer uh, you know system analytics versus by a human, that they were more comfortable with that. Right. But then I go back to to Mikolaj and what you showed us, right, where the machine learning was oftentimes so wrong. OK, so so there's those two pieces. But then I also want to tie it back to you, Jan, where, OK, if we have if we as researchers have some kind of ethical responsibility to intervene, perhaps in the case of depression or in the case of, of mental illness or, or in any case, uh, in, in the case of, of, of um, vul any vulnerability. H how do we tie all those three pieces together then? I, I, don't, I don't have the answer. And, and it's, it, as soon as I saw that data, it was like, uh-oh, <laughs> where do we go with this? Yeah, I, well, so, uh, I think that's a good grant right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't have an answer to the question. I mean, I, I I think that it's important to understand why people feel more comfortable with um, with having a machine analyze their content rather than a human. And part of it is because of the fear of human judgment. Uh, one of the things, so one of the things we did in our survey is that we left we've left the opportunity available for people to include additional like comments about the questions. And one of the things that we, that we got was very active mistrust of researchers, uh, the belief that researchers were politically biased um, or that the researchers are only out there for their own gain. And so there was this you know, idea that certainly seems to be tacit in the data that um, you know, despite despite people who might have the STS background, who might have the you know the the knowledge that you know machine, algorithms can be biased, that there is a more public belief that these things are neutral, and that's something that we're going to have to sort of think through and and deal with. Yeah, and it's funny again to to go to to Mikolaj, when I hear you say human judgment, I think of implicit bias that are then embedded in our in our systems and in our tools. Yeah, I think there are two opposing forces here at play. One, the one that Nick uh, mentioned, the fear of human judgment, and the other one, uh, which is basically um, giving or assigning agency uh, to machines where there is no agency at all. For instance, if you give a messenger the access to your microphone, the messenger will uh, eavesdrop on your conversation. So if on the phone you mention a certain uh, brand, uh, say I'm thinking about buying this and that, uh, you're more likely than not to see the advert for that particular brand in your Facebook feeds uh, two, two, two days um, in the future. But people will think someone is listening to my conversations. They, they, they have heard the brand, so that's why I'm saying this. Of course, nobody listens to that, right? Even the, the American, uh, uh, even the Secret Service, uh, which uh, eavesdrops on, on every sim single conversation in the world, uh, they also have just certain words or combination of words that, 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 that they listen to. Um, but people somehow mix those two modalities the the idea of a machine which is impartial which does not judge which just something goes in and there is some rumbling and the number comes out basically that's the idea the public idea of a machine analyzing the data versus the researcher looking at the data and and uh, somehow um uh, judging me for my character, for what I've said, what I'm searching for. I mean, yeah, before my death, please delete my browsing history, right? This is <laughs> the most important thing you should you should ask. You should, you should write, write down in your will, right? So nobody uh, sees that. Um, so, so, yeah, people are just very, very confused about uh, what is being done to their data, who is doing this, what incentives there are at play, uh, where the money is, 
and uh, what their input is. Uh, I, I would say I would rather approach it from the economical point of view, trying to educate people about yeah the, 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 the economical play behind all of that, because it's not nefarious. Just there are huge companies that just want to sell you more of their crap. That's that's what it is. So people should understand that and should understand that they are if they are not paying with their money, they are paying with their clicks, views, eyeball, eyeballs, uh, minutes of attention, uh, which is the, the 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 greatest price to pay given the finite amount of time that we have <laughs> here on Earth. Um, so I would I would rather go into economy and trying to educate people on that level rather than trying to to open the research and saying, yeah, please understand this is and that is and this is how we do it and that's why we do it. Uh, might be, I don't, I don't know if it's a better way, but I have a hunch that it will be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I was also thinking about what, about the reason why, why people are so suspicious uh, about researchers and I agree that they don't want to be the, that they don't want to be judged. But when we are talking about also this um, obligations of researchers to to act, we we are some uh, we are somehow uh, coming back to, to to this double role of, for instance, researchers uh, researcher who is also a physician, and in the context of internet research, it uh, does not happen. So researchers is just researcher and uh, the motive of research uh, is quite mysterious for people. Why uh, social researchers do research? Why computer researchers do research? We know why doctors uh, uh, perform research because and, and, and we want them to conduct as many research uh, uh, trials uh, and uh, our observations as it possible because we have hope also in uh, medicine and um, and that's why people also may, may may think that that they want would like to contribute to contribute to to biomedical research but all this sphere of uh, computer research and uh, social re research may seem to be very uh, so suspicious and and somehow it conflates with with this uh, commercial aspect and uh, uh, that that Mikowai uh, described that 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 the whole uh, let's say um, internet in industry want want, want to play. Uh, 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 play our 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 desires and want to make uh, and, and 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 want to press as much money as possible from from uh, from uh, from our pocket. So, on the other hand, uh, so uh, so I'm uh, so uh, I agree with with Mikola in this respect that the ed education should be also ab about the the business side. But I I still think that that this idea. That also researchers share the uh, share the intentions, and also uh, I like very much this idea to document uh, ethical uh, deliberation and ethical um, uh, process. Uh, because I, I I believe that that sometimes even when we make mistakes, but we make certain mistakes in a good faith, this somehow. Um, Maybe not excuse us totally, but uh, at least shows that we uh, mm, that we try our best to understand the problem, and with that, and at, at least that we had a good, uh, good, uh, good uh, intentions. So uh, this is probably not not very utilitarian uh, uh, approach, but I think that 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 still it is in, in, important because. Uh, also, uh, the procedure uh, that we take in order to come to a certain conclusion seems to be important from the ethical point point of view. You are uh, muted. 
Um, you would think after all these months, right? Um, we're, we're just about at time. Um, all of our emails are available on the project webpage. If, if any of the questions didn't get answered, if you have further follow up, um, feel free to reach out to, to any of us and I'll turn it back to, to you, Jan. Thank you. And now you're now muted. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the seminar uh, came so to uh, to its end. So I would like to thank uh, first of all our participants. Thank you for all your questions and uh, comments and for being with us. Then, of course, I would like to thank our great guests, Elizabeth and Nicholas, and of course Mikolai. And uh, I also want to thank. Agnieszka Lempart, our administrative uh, manager. She did a fantastic job organizing and uh, advertising this event. And without her, this event simply wouldn't happen. So thank you all. Thank you and goodbye.